DevOps has changed how we think about and practice software development for the better. I confess that I have a somewhat ambivalent relationship with the term. On one hand, I'm seen as one of the people that has helped to popularise it. I think that the ideas discussed under the banner of DevOps are important to doing a good job. I am a believer and a supporter and a promoter of these ideas. On the other hand, I don't very much like the term. It's confusing and leads people to make mistakes. So what is the good and the bad of DevOps? Oh, and I warn you in advance, I'm probably going to mention what I think of as a better organising idea, continuous delivery along the way. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, and Specflow. They're helping us with our channel, so please do check their links in the description with, below. Um, if you're interested in the topics covered here today, perhaps the best place to start is to take a look at my book, Continuous Delivery. It's been around for a little while, but if you haven't already got a copy, there's a special offer on now. I've been lucky in my career to have been close to the birth of several big ideas. Ideas that later became widely adopted, popular even. My observation is that the response of the creators of these ideas is nearly always the same. Uh, that's not what we really meant. As an idea spreads, it gets translated and it tends to morph into something different. The people that invented the term continuous integration meant integrate everybody's changes together multiple times per day. Most development teams heard run a copy of Jenkins. DevOps is kind of the same. The people who popularised it were focused on reducing the friction in the process of releasing software. They had seen that agile thinking had changed how small teams worked, but that those teams still often struggled to release changes with high enough quality and fast enough, particularly in larger organisations. Patrick Dubois and Andrew Clay started the conversation around 2008. Meanwhile, I and my teammates had been facing similar problems. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, I worked on teams that had adopted extreme programming. We used these techniques to work on gradually larger and more complex projects, although at the time they were more widely seen as small projects only approach. We saw the same problems as the DevOps folk. By 2008, Jess Humble and I were halfway through writing our book, our response later became known as continuous delivery. The DevOps folk primarily approached this common problem from the perspective of operations. And the key friction that they addressed was the classic disconnect between development and operations. Of course, there was much more to it, even in these early days. The classic problem, though, between dev and ops is that the de developers are incentivized to release change, while operations is incentivized to maintain stability in production. The naive pre-DevOps view is that these two are in tension. Evil, lazy developers would optimize their process to generate piles of crap code and dump it on poor, unsuspecting operators and intransigent, truculent operators from hell would ask for family members as hostages and paperwork that weighed more than a building before allowing any change into production. There was certainly some element of truth in both of these rather strange caricatures, but the real problem was more to do with how organisations and teams were structured, because often it was this that forced people into some version of these dumb stereotypical roles. DevOps and continuous delivery were addressing much of the same problem, but we began from different directions, and I think that coloured our perspectives and the language that we used to describe them. So let's start simply with the good and the bad. So we have people working on dev stuff and people working on ops stuff. 
It is in no one's interest to either produce crap systems or to prevent any change into production. If we do the first one, we'll all be out of work because no one will buy our products. If we do the second one, we'll all be out of work because there aren't, we aren't releasing any products. So the first good idea is let's work together to produce good quality stuff and get it out to our users and customers quickly and efficiently. This is clearly in everyone's interest and in the commercial interest of the organisations that employ us all. So let's work to break down the barriers between dev and ops. Those of us engaged in extreme programming and software development saw this in the context primarily of upping our game so that we would not be throwing crap over the wall to ops. Those of us approaching this from an ops perspective saw this primarily as a cultural problem and focused on the need to work more closely with devs. But that doesn't mean that us CDers didn't think about the culture or that the DevOpsers didn't think about the tech. I worked on several of the projects that are now seen as pioneering in continuous delivery. I can assure you that we consciously reached out to ops people and engaged with them. We worked hard to find ways to make their life easier. In part, this was purely enlightened self-interest. We wanted to earn the freedom to release our changes more often into production. We weren't going to get that freedom if we didn't earn the trust of the ops people. So both groups, CD and DevOps, worked hard to improve the collaboration across this former divide. We broke the barriers and brought Dev and Ops together. Which brings us to our first bad, I suppose. What lots of people heard when people started talking about DevOps was, we need a DevOps team. So instead of two silos, Dev and Ops, we now have three, Dev, Ops and DevOps. This became quite a big thing and people with DevOps skills became a hot commodity in the job market. They probably still are a bit. This is a problem because the whole point is to remove friction, to smooth the path for changes. Let's imagine a change. A software as a software developer, I want to add a new service to my system. In the old days, this was really rather difficult. I probably wasn't allowed to just add any new VM or server to host my new service, even if it only was in a test environment. I'd almost certainly have to raise a ticket. If you have any continuous delivery developers on your team of a certain age and want to see them shudder, just say, raise a ticket. Now we've handed over our destiny to some other group of people. We'll have to wait for them to prioritise it and to, do the, and to do the work. And we'll have to hope that when they do the work, they'll do it in the way that we'd like it to be done. Similarly, what if we're on the ops team and want to add some extra info to the logs so that when that pesky error crops up again, we can trace the users that it affects? Guess what? In the bad old days, we'd have to raise a ticket again. So now let's imagine a DevOps team. I want to add a new service. Cool, I'll script the provisioning and the installation and get to work on creating it and then testing it. If we've optimised our process and technology to allow for this kind of thing, I can probably do all of this in a handful of lines of code and a few seconds or, worst case, a few minutes. If I need more help, as soon as I perceive the need, I can probably talk to my ops colleague who is probably sitting in the next, next to me or close by and is incentivised to deliver new high quality features to users, same as me. They can start work on making any changes necessary that we need straight away. So this is about as good as we can imagine doing. The same scenario for a dev, DevOps and ops organisation is going to end up being pretty similar to the dev and ops case, but possibly even more complicated. I'll leave the rest of that to your imagination because the overheads are obvious and how the split between ops and DevOps manifests itself is usually pretty specific to the organisation. One of the commonest other anti-patterns though is not to have Dev, Ops and DevOps, but to have Dev and DevOps. 
Usually, what this really means, particularly in bigger, more traditional organisations, is that they've just noticed that something interesting is going on. What's all this talk about DevOps? People say it's good. But they don't really understand what it means. So surprisingly often, what they take it to mean is Ops is now called DevOps. So the Ops team gets renamed but carries on working in the same old way. Did you raise a ticket for that? None of the people here are stupid, but sometimes the organisational structures are. What we're really looking for is a high quality, efficient way of making changes. It's in everybody's interest to optimise for that. If we want to build complex systems, we need to be able to work on them incrementally, growing their capabilities step by step, giving us the opportunity to learn what really works. That means that we need to be able to do that sustainably and reliably. It's in everybody's interest to do that too. If we produce crap, it should be rejected. And it's in our interest to see that rejection as close to the point at which we made the mistake as we can possibly get. That means that we need to optimise to remove work and unnecessary delays everywhere that we can. So the next common bad for DevOps is doing low quality work to simply release fast. This isn't the same thing at all. That is neither DevOps nor continuous delivery. Our aim is to create great work, but to do it quickly and efficiently. The state of DevOps reports lists some of the technical practices that allow us to measurably achieve the, that aim. Loosely coupled architecture, trunk-based development, continuous testing, continuous integration, use of open source technologies, monitoring and observability practices, management of database changes, deployment automation. This stuff probably sounds pretty familiar to any regulars here. If you do these things, then statistically, the companies that you work for make more money. You produce better software more quickly, and you have more fun while you're doing it. This is all based on data from tens of thousands of projects. This year's report goes on to say this. We found that while all of these practices improve continuous delivery, loosely coupled architecture and continuous testing have the greatest impact. If our aim is to create great software quickly, then we need to do a high quality job, not create crap quickly. We also need to do a good job of knowing where we stand with our changes. I don't mean that in some arbitrary sense of tracking progress against a plan en route to a delivery. I mean concretely, does the system do what we expect it to do in production? Is it useful to people? Is it fast enough, resilient enough, secure enough? Is it about to stop working because we're running out of capacity? Do our users and customers like it? Are we on the right track with our products? Does this make commercial sense for us to carry on? Some of these questions are clearly in the realm of what used to be thought of as operations. Some are clearly in the realm of product design. And some are clearly in the realm of software development. To do a good job, we need feedback from production on all of these things. It isn't only an operations problem. This is one of the places where I start to prefer my continuous delivery terminology rather than that of DevOps. Sure, the DevOps folk worry about all of this stuff too, but the focus on only Dev and Ops doesn't say so. So my final DevOps bad is a somewhat personal one. I really do dislike the term, as I said earlier, but it has become common currency. The trouble with me saying this is that as one of the authors of the book that popularised the idea of continuous delivery, it does sound rather self-serving, and I really don't mean that. I think that the words that we choose for things matter sometimes. They can help us to express our ideas more clearly, but they can also help us to access new ideas. Um, if we pick the wrong words, then we limit the ideas that are easy to think about. If I go back to my earlier example of being a developer and wanting to make a change, what if instead of wanting to add a service, the change that I wanted to make is to perhaps add a new column to a database, or maybe a new feature that may open the system to new security threats? 
Or what if I have an idea that may allow us to sell more widgets and I'd like to make a small change to test it out and see if it works? It's not at all obvious that these things are part of DevOps too, though they probably are. How do Dev and Ops working closely together reduce the friction for these problems? Beyond the obvious that all changes will be easier if Dev and Ops work together, they don't really. The, to ease the path for these changes, we need to reduce the friction between everyone. This is where we get into the silliness of DevSec biz ops and so on. But if our guiding principle is the continuous delivery of value into production, then I, at least, find it easier to think about what that may mean in each of these examples. Our highest priority, as the Agile Manifesto says, is the early and continuous delivery of valuable software to our users. If we take that statement at its face value, then it's pretty clear that we should optimise for this. In all of these cases, since it's our highest priority, we should do everything, whatever it takes, to optimise for this. We need to remove waste work to eliminate unnecessary steps. We need to minimise friction, reduce handovers and bureaucracy along the way. We need people in all roles to collaborate as close to seamlessly as we can possibly get. We need to treat the quality of our work as a first-class concern and gather feedback on it efficiently so that we can quickly see if we make a mistake. Not only because it's nicer and more efficient for us to work that way, but also because we're less likely to end up handing crap work to people downstream and so causing them more work. So this also means that overall the process as a whole is more efficient. We'll need to automate a lot of this stuff to make it efficient, repeatable and reliable. DevOps and continuous delivery arose in response to a common set of problems. We approached those problems from two different directions and arrived at the same conclusions. I think that this says something important. I think that this is a form of independent validation for these ideas. A form of peer review, if you like. I think that the concept of continuous delivery is a more useful tool. It provides us a guide that helps us to solve any problem in software development. It is both more prescriptive, work so that your software is always in a releasable state, and more general, valuable software in the hands of users. And since it's our highest priority, let's optimise for that. Thank you very much for watching.